Thank you, Allison. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon to congratulate Allison and the Autism Science Foundation for five years and actually to give a little preview of this uh, new collaboration uh, that we're carrying out with the Autism Science Foundation. So uh, I'm supposed to talk about brains, and uh, unlike Woody Allen, for me, the brain I, is my favorite organ. Um, and it's uh, my favorite organ because it's really a miracle of ev evolution. So the human brain has 100 billion neurons. Uh, these neurons are all interconnected with each other, and there's at least 100 trillion uh, synapses, a, a huge number. During development, the cerebral cortex, which we think is probably going to be the region that's most impacted by autism spectrum disorder, uh, has about 20 billion neurons. And during the peak of neurogenesis that happens during the 13th and 20th week of pregnancy, cells are generated at the astonishing rate of 2,500 per second. These cells, the, the immature neurons, have to then migrate along a pathway uh, from where they're born in the red area there in, in, in the ventricular zone up to the definitive cortical plate where they form these columnar central processing units. So when you think about all the complex things that the brain has to go through in order to, uh, to develop itself, it's not surprising that there are errors in how the brain develops. Uh, what's surprising is, is that it ever develops normally. So um, for those of you who are not neuroscientists, a couple of more facts about the brain. Uh, it turns out that we are going to have virtually all of the neurons that we're ever going to have by the end of the sixth month of pregnancy. But then what happens after that, these neurons form connections, and there's a refinement of this process of connection formation and elimination that actually takes many years. There's some evidence that in humans it may even go into the 30s, into the third decade. So the brain uh, is about 25% of its adult size uh, at birth and grows to 95% of its adult size by the age of six. Uh, these are MRIs that are taking it of children at, at different ages. Uh, and what we, what we think, and you heard this echoed by Ami, is that uh, most of the alterations that ultimately lead to autism probably take place during the first few years of life or, or prenatally. Uh, so you can actually see how much of a change the brain takes during the first few years. Uh, these are actually slides from a, a, a neurologist Cornell, who studied the human brain over a period of 30 years and actually just described what it looks like, the, the developmental time course. And what you can see in these pictures is that each of these individual dots is the cell body of a neuron. And at one month, they're very tightly packed. And over time, uh, the neurons get bigger, the cell bodies get bigger, and there's more space around the neurons. And if you stain the neurons by a different technique that shows their entirety, uh, the Golgi technique, what you actually see is that neurons are like trees. And over this first couple of years of life, the trees sprout enormous numbers of branches. And as many as 25,000 or more connections are made with each one of these neurons. So the unfortunate thing is at the moment, we don't know what uh, happens in terms of this complicated developmental process that ultimately leads uh, to autism. Now, this isn't the case for all diseases. So if we take as an example Alzheimer's disease, uh, Alois Alzheimer, uh, over a century ago in 1907, studied the brain of a woman who had an early onset form of Alzheimer's, Augusta D. And what he found was that within the cell bodies of, the, of her neurons, for her per cortical pyramidal cells, there were these uh, curious profiles called tangles. And subsequent to his initial finding, thousands, if not tens of thousands, of brains from Alzheimer's patients have been studied. And what we now know is that on the right are the uh, neurofibrillate tangles, and on the left in this picture are the so-called amyloid plaques. But these are the hallmark signatures of, of Alzheimer's disease. And any brain that comes from a patient with Alzheimer's uh, will have these markers. So much are we sure that this is the pathology of Alzheimer's that virtually all the therapeutic efforts that are going on now are aimed at either preventing these profiles from ever forming or eliminating them before they call, cause cell damage that leads to the memory loss and all the other changes consequent to Alzheimer's disease. So 
now put this in relation to autism spectrum disorder, uh, the history of, of research on uh, the, the neuropathology of autism goes back only a few years. So the first neuropathological studies were done in the 1980s. So far, no consistent sign of disease like plaques and tangles have yet been found. However, believe it or not, through the entirety of autism research, fewer than 150 brains have ever been studied uh, at the histological level. And, and a very few number of these uh, have been looked at uh, quantitatively. It's not to say that we haven't seen things. So a colleague of mine, uh, Cindy Schumann and I, looked at the brains, uh, the part of the brain called the amygdala, which is buried deep in the brain. It's involved in emotion. We think it actually may be involved in the anxiety component of, of autism. And uh, what we know from MRI studies that we and others have done is that the amygdala is too big in young children with autism, but in older individuals with autism, it's actually too small. So it goes through a, a, a developmental process that's abnormal. And sure enough, when we tried to count neurons in the brains of individuals who were adults, or adolescent at least, uh, with autism, we found that the amygdala had too few neurons. Something had gone wrong in the amygdala, to uh, either damage, either not develop the adequate amount early on, or, or to damage neurons once they were there. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to look at the amygdala and understand what leads to the amygdala being too big early on because there aren't the brains available. So I mentioned that uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is one way to actually get a sense of what's going wrong in the neuropathology of autism. And in fact, we and others have shown that, um, that as one example, 15% of boys who have autism have a brain that develops too big. In, in this picture, what you can see is that the brain to the far right is from a child that, whose brain is 20% larger than would be expected. Uh, this is actually a highly replicable finding across many labs over the last, actually since about 2001. But we still don't know what leads to the brain being too big. And the reason we don't know that is because there are not brains available in order to study uh, what might be going on at these very early ages of autism. MRI can't do this. And some people say, well, why can't you do better MRI? Well, it turns out that the smallest thing that you can see in MRI is called the voxel. And the voxel uh, has within it uh, as many as 50,000 neurons and anywhere between 100 and 300 million connections. So it's actually too crude, too coarse to be able to understand what's happening at a cellular level. And this is not only neurohistology or neuropathology, even the genetics of autism are, are not going to be uh, understood fully uh, without uh, having brains available for study. Here's a, a study that was published actually a few years back by Dan Geshwin and his group at UCLA. And there, there's many, many things in this paper that are of interest, but one of the intriguing findings was that if you look at the top, it says controls 500 genes in the, the two different color blue uh, boxes. What that means is that there were 510 genes that were functioning differently in the frontal lobe compared to the temporal lobe. And that probably has something to do with conditioning those two parts of the brain for the special functions that they have. But if you look at the bottom, what we see is that in the brains that they looked at from individuals with autism, there were only eight genes that had this differential regulation. This suggests that there's a fundamental difference in how genes are regulated in the autistic brain. But this study has not been replicated because there are not brains available to do that. So uh, the bottom line is that there's many levels, as you're hearing about this afternoon, for analysis of autism. Uh, certainly at the social level, uh, as we heard from Ami Klin, there's, there's much that can be done. Uh, we can understand a little bit about the, the, brain, the systems of the body that may be impacted through MRI, but the reality is to really understand the fundamental differences in circuits, synapses, and ultimately genetics of autism, we are going to require to have brain material. So at the moment, we've reached a bottleneck uh, in autism research. Oh, good, you like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the reality is uh, that neuropathology, genetics, and neurochemistry are all going to be relying on the fact that we have adequate postmortem brain tissue for analysis. And it's going to be understanding these components of autism that are most quickly going to lead to therapies and cures. <laughs> 
So uh, as Allison mentioned, this has led us with support from the Simons Foundation, from Autism Speaks, and Autism Science Foundation to develop Autism Brain Debt. And I won't go into much detail, just say that we have a national organization uh, that will uh, create a database of clinical information about the donor, uh, donors that uh, we receive brains from, um, and we'll make sure that the tissue gets distributed to the highest quality scientists throughout the world who are interested in studying brain and, and its relation to autism. But key to this is that we have a group of uh, nodes, we call them. Uh, in, at, we're starting off with nodes in Sacramento, Dallas, Boston, and New York. And in these nodes, which are at universities that have uh, up and running autism programs, and directors, uh, Cindy Schumann in Sacramento, Carol Taminga in Texas, Patrick Hoff in New York, and Matt Anderson in Boston, uh, these people will optimize the uh, whole process of obtaining brain tissue. And the goal of having a network is twofold. One, it allows us to get the highest quality donation because we can shorten the time to acquisition of the donation to the bare minimum. And secondly, these nodes will be able to reach out regionally to families and as well as to medical examiners and coroners. But the critical piece to making this all successful is that we have to have families talking to other families about the desperate need of thinking about brain donations uh, for the fostering of autism research. And so I'm so happy that we've actually been able to partner with uh, Allison and, and the Autism Science Foundation who are spearheading the outreach campaign. You know, I think this is one of the most difficult challenges and topics I've ever had to deal with in my career. But I think with support of families like the Matthews, that Autism Brain Net is going to speed us along to the treatments and the cures that we all hope for. So uh, I'm very enthusiastic, and with that, I'll just say thanks very much from my home institution. Oops, it's gone. <laughs> thanks very much.